that hour she asked any more about the window, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So uh, we have the uh, disappearance of Lochan Thakur, appearance of Jiva Goswami, and the uh, appearance of Jagadish Pandit. Uh, Lochan Das Thakur was on the 4th, I believe, two days ago. But it's been asked to be included in today's discussion, so we'll start with Lochan Das Thakur. And we'll try to give a brief overview of each of the lives and the contributions of each of these great personalities. Uh, their lives are quite uh, voluminous in the amount of information available about them. And uh, each of the, all of the information has many facets to it. So we could discuss just one of these personalities for many hours, but we will try to do a very succinct and very, as much as the time allows, something important part of their life. Uh, Lochandas Thakur um, is a, was a very uh, dear disciple of Srila Narahari Sakar. <laughs> Uh, when we uh, sing the Gore Arti in the evenings in our temples, we sing Nara Hari Ari Kodi Chamara Dulaya Sanjay Amukunda Vasu Gosh Arigaya. There's one stanza from that particular bhajan glorifying Lord Chaitanya's Arti in the house of Sri Vasudhakor where it describes Narahari Sakar is there and he's fanning with a charmana, charmana, charmana risk. Um, we, we, when we do our artis, we have the, the yak tail with the charmana risk and we have the peacock fan. Charmana risk is very nice. You see it in artis and it's done all year round. And uh, in the, describing that particular RT, you'll see a Narahari is mentioned as one who is fanning Lord Chaitanya with the charm of So one of his disciples was Lochan Das Thakur. Lochan Das Thakur uh, was brought up in a village in West Bengal. At a very early age, he wound up getting married. His, his marriage was a child marriage. His wife was, was I think, eight or 10 years old at the time. And um, he wasn't much older. So at that time, although the, the Vedic custom is to marry at the early age before the girl receives puberty, and that way she becomes connected to her husband in a lifelong way, but they don't live together until they're more grown up. And so he, although he was married, he separated from his wife. And during that time of separation as a young boy, he became very interested in spiritual life and took headlong into studying and hearing about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. After some time, uh, he went to the ashram of Narahari Sakur and lived under his care. And uh, he lived there for many years, uh, completely forgetting about his village life and his wife also, who was just a child at the time when they married. Um, after about Oh, I think it was 10 years, it's mentioned that he trained and served under Narahari Sakur. Um, some persons, some people say 
it was the relatives of the daughter, but that doesn't seem to be correct. It was just other persons who actually knew about the marriage and pointed out to Narahari Sakur that this person that's in your ashram is a brahmachari. He has a wife in the village, and they mentioned the village. Uh, Narahari was concerned that he was married and he was not taking care of his responsibilities and household life. So he sent him back to his village to meet his wife and live in the Grihas as a married person there. So he left the ashram and went back. As he returned to his own village, he, did, he couldn't even remember the place where his wife was living, nor his wife at all had been so long. And then he saw one lady she was drawing water from a well, so he thought he'd inquire about it. He did, and um, she, although he didn't realize it, it was his wife he was asking where his wife's house was. <laughs> and he addressed her as Mataji, her mother. He called her mother. And uh, she understood who he was, and she didn't say anything at the time, and she directed him to the house. Later on the next day, when he came to the house, that same woman was there. And then she explained, well, I, I'm your wife. <laughs> oh, okay. And uh, so, although he wasn't very much inclined to it, because it was the instructions of his spiritual master, he uh, went back to that atmosphere, but he had no inclination for household life. So with his wife, all he would do every day in the evening, mostly, is they would sit together and he would read scripture to her like that. And this went on. And he had called her mother when he saw her at the well in the according to Vedic culture. All women are addressed as mother except one's wife. <laughs> and then he reminded her that he, he cannot see her as his wife now because he had referred to her as mother. <laughs> uh, she was very understanding of this situation and he tried to live there, but she could see he was not at all inclined to household life, nor was he. So she said, I think it's time that you return to your spiritual master. So he did. <clears throat> Later on, he became famous for writing one book called uh, Chaitanya Mangala. Uh, just at that time, Vrindavan Das Thakur had already written a treatise on the life of Lord Chaitanya, along with his pastimes and activities, which was called Chaitanya Mangala. But then when he learned that Lochan Das Thakur had also written a book on Lord Chaitanya called Chaitanya Mangala, Vrindavan Das Thakur changed his book to Chaitanya Bhagavad. Uh, Vrindavan Das Thakur is considered to be the father of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Um, even Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, the author of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which we know as the, what the Srila Prabhupada presented to us as the way to hear about Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Um, he always referred to Vrindavan Das Thakur as, as the father of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Um, there, there are these three scriptures, Chaitanya Mangala, Chaitanya Chari, Tamrita, and Chaitanya Bhagavad, all authorized and bona fide accounts of the life of Lord Chaitanya with a slightly different angle in each of them. Chaitanya Bhagavad is the most extensive and voluminous. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati did commentaries on the entire, and it's been printed in ISKCON. Well, not, I think the Gaudiya Moth printed and we also took it as the, uh, uh, there was about eight or nine volumes, each volume two or 300 pages each. 
And so that became uh, the uh, authorized version. But then later on, Chaitanya Charitamrita came on the request of, um, uh, who's it? Sri Damodar Goswami, the secretary of Lord Chaitanya. After Lord Chaitanya had disappeared, he had requested um, uh, uh, yeah, he requested Vrindavan, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami to write uh, Chaitanya, the life of Lord Chaitanya based on the notes of uh, Raghunath Das Thakur and Sri Damada, who took extensive notes on the activities in life of Lord Chaitanya. Uh, Chaitanya Mangala is given by uh, Lochan Das Thakur is a very shortened version, more like a synopsis of some of the main pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. Not a very extensive, the book is much smaller than both of these other books in comparison, but it's very much authorized and it has some details and explanations that are not mentioned in the other biographies by these other two personalities. Um, so that became also one of the authorized versions. Uh, and particularly uh, Lord Chaitanya's marriage to Vishnu Priya is extensively described in Chaitanya Mangala by Ochandas Thakur, where you don't find that, that detailed explanation in either of the other two accounts of Lord Chaitanya's life. Uh, each of the authors sort of focuses a little bit on one particular aspect, but Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is very careful not to try to surpass Vrindavan Das Thakur. And he mentions some of the pastimes that Vrindavan Das Thakur uh, mentions, but he does not go into details. For instance, in the pastime of, um, of uh, Lord Chaitanya marching with all, all his devotees on the house of Chan Kazi, uh, after the Kazi had broken the drums, the Lord got angry and organized Maha Harinam Sankirtan, and millions of people from all over the universe came for that Harinam. Uh, when Ravan Das Thakur spent 745 verses describing that particular pastime, where I think Krishna Das Kariyaj Goswami only spends about 100 and some verses on that. So you'll see the emphasis is slightly different on there. And the unique feature about Vrindavan Das Thakur is that he is a initiated and follower of Lord Nityananda more than he is of Lord Chaitanya. He accepts both, but he always glorifies Lord Nityananda as his supreme guru. And therefore, you'll find chapters in Vrindavan Das Thakur's uh, account on the life of Lord Chaitanya that are simply dedicated to the life of Lord Nityananda. You don't find them in Chaitanya Charitamrita. And Srila Prabhupada's establishing our Krishna consciousness movement. He chose Chaitanya Charitamrita for two reasons. One, or maybe we can actually mention, mention three reasons. One is that in Vrindavan Das, that core is mostly Leela. There is not so much tattva or philosophical explanations. But those philosophical explanations were given by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in his commentary on Chaitanya Bhagavat. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada didn't want to uh, present Chaitanya Bhagavat to us and write purports on that because it is the etiquette not, try, not to try to surpass the previous Acharya by writing about the same thing they wrote about. You can comment and critique what they wrote and write to explain what they wrote. But Prabhupada knew he had to give his own Bhaktivedanta purports, and so he chose Chaitanya Charitamrita and then to, to give chastity to his own spiritual master by not trying to surpass him with his own commentaries. 
And the second reason was, again, Chaitanya Charitamrita is more tattva. It's a lot of lila, but tattva is supported extensively in Chaitanya Charitamrita because you'll find that there are many, many, many verses that are referenced by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami in relationship to the leelas coming from Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam verses are mentioned to support the leelas in Chaitanya Charitamrita. You don't find that either so much in Lochan Das Thakur's work nor in Chaitanya Bhagavatam. But you do find an extensive uh, commentary by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So we recommend that devotees read Chaitanya, all three of these accounts because they all have a spe specific flavor that's unique, yet at the same time, they're covering very nicely both the Leela and the Tattva of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> okay, that's a little bit about, and then we can speak a little bit about Srila Jiva Goswami. Jiva Goswami, uh, Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, Pande Rupa Sanatana Rivuya Go, Sri Jiva Go Ko. Six Goswamis of Vrindavan are the heirs to Lord Chaitanya's teaching, and they have taken those teachings and written many, many books about the glories and pastimes of Krishna and Vrindavan, along with the Tattva of Sanatana Dharma, eternal religious principles. Jiva Goswami is considered to be the most prolific out of all of the writers in Vaishnav culture in explaining philosophical teachings from all angles of vision. His most famous work are the Sandarbhas, the Kramya Sandarbha, the Bhakti Sandarbha, the the Bhagavad Sandharva, the Tattva Sandharva, the, the Priti Sandharva, and the Krishna Sandharva. These Sandharvas, or works, uh, commentaries on the revealed scriptures, are very deep in philosophical teachings. Uh, and it's recommended that we read them, especially Tattva Sandharva, which is the foremost and the one that is the springboard that leads to the other Sandarbhas. And there is a order by which one should read these Sandarbhas in order to follow Jiva Goswami's pattern of explanations. Jiva Goswami wrote 25 different uh, philosophical teachings. Um, the Sandarbhas are one of them. And, the, and of course, uh, He's written many, many other books and also commentaries. He grew up in the village, which we know now as uh, in an area which is now East Bengal. <clears throat> uh, he was the younger, uh, he was the son of, the, of uh, Anupam, Anupam was originally named Balaba, but Lord Chaitanya changed his name to Anupam, and his son was Jiva. And uh, Anupam was the brother of Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, so there were three brothers. So Jiva was the nephew of Rupa and Sanatana Goswami. Uh, Anupam died at a very young age, and Jiva Goswami took shelter of his uncles and because he did that, he became very much interested in philosophical and spiritual matters. Of course, that interest was there even from a young boy. It's described how he used to create these different deities. When he was small, he would make deities out of earth and sand and various times. And he would make them in the forms of Radha, Krishna, and some of the cowherd boys in Vrindavan, he would worship them as deities. And he developed an attachment and an affection for these deities, so much so that it described that he would he would dress them, he would <laughs> he would bathe, he would do everything that you would normally do for a deity <clears throat> in a very <clears throat> simplified way, being a, he was just a young boy. 
but he became so attached to these deities that it describes that he would sometimes show emotional expressions in worshiping these deities. So from his very young age, when he was a very, still a child, he met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu at Rama Kelly. When Rama, Lord Chaitanya was on his way to Vrindavan, he stopped at Rama Kelly. Um, he left to Jagannath Puri and traveled, came to the village of Rama Kelly, where Rupa and Sanatana Goswami were staying as ministers at the time. Jiva Goswami was there. Jiva Goswami was really a young child. I don't think he was more than five or six years old at the time. And that's the first time he had, they actually came in contact with Lord Chaitanya. When he saw Lord Chaitanya, his heart was overwhelmed and he made it a vow that he was going to eventually come and associate and serve Lord Chaitanya. There are many wonderful stories of the life of Jiva Goswami, how he initiated book distribution. He was the first person to really initiate book distribution in that, at, during that time. Uh, when uh, um, Shamananda Pandit and uh, who else was that? Uh, well, let me think. Who hmm. was hmm. I can't think. Somebody can remind me of that one great soul. Narottam Das Thakur. Not not uh, not Narottam, but uh, oh Srinivasacharya. Srinivas Srinivasacharya. Yes, yeah, yeah. Srinivasacharya, Narottam Das Thakur, and my shaman on the planet. Uh, we're living at the, the Davan at the time, and Jiva Goswami made a program to have all of the main books of the Goswamis at that time copied. There was only one copy of some of the main books. Uh, Ujwala Nilamani by Rupa Goswami, um, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita by Sanatan Goswami, um, and other works of the Goswamis also uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami's Chaitanya Charitamrita. Jiva Goswami uh, packed all of these books in a large trunk and he asked these three souls to take these books to Navadweep from Vrindavan, they were in Vrindavan, and have them copied by the scribes there and made many copies. So um, and so he arranged that. Um, but unfortunately, when they took the box of books, along with 11 guards and a caravan, the books were stolen by one king, King Birhambir in the province of Bala Vishnupur. And at that time, the three of them had to separate. Naratam went back to Ram, to uh, Kateri Gram, his own home to preach. Uh, Shamananda Pandit went to Utkala, which is known in the area of Jagannath Puri, to preach. And um, Srinivasacharya stayed to return and retrieve the books, which he did. And then, of course, the books were taken to Navadweep and copied. And then many copies were, and then book distribution began in that area. Like that. And you'll see in one book, by Nityananda Das, he describes, or not he describes, but there is an account of the letters sent by Jiva Goswami to Srinivasacharya, to who else? Um, to others discussing distribution. So uh, book distribution goes back to the time of the Goswamis in Vrindavan. Um, Jiva Goswami is quite controversial. Um, we understand that many of his writings were diversionary writings in order to get people to stop making offenses against Radha Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. 
So there are two relationships with Krishna in his female counterparts. There are the gopis and the queens, or there is what is called Swakya Ras and Parakya Ras. And Parakya Ras is lawless love. And that is Krishna and the gopis. The gopis are apparently, we have to remember this word, apparently married to other cowherd persons in Vrindavan, but they escape to go to be with Krishna. And that is considered the highest and most purest form of loving relationships between Krishna and his parts and parcels. And then you have the marriage, which is called Swakya Ras. And so the Lord Chaitanya, I mean, Lord Krishna engages in both of these rasas, they're called Paraki and Swakya. But Paraki is considered higher because it's more deeper, more sweeter, and more adventurous. In the material world, um, the opposite is true. That in, to have a husband and a wife and to, and to have an, a lover on the side is considered to be a sinful activity. It's considered to be a degraded activity. It's not accepted. But in the spiritual world, it's considered to be the highest because the mood is to serve Krishna in that mood. So Jiva Goswami, knowing that Parakya Ras is the highest, some of the, what we say, unauthorized persons who are exploiting Lord J Krishna's pastimes would try to engage in Parakya activities imitating Lord Krishna. So he wrote against that by explaining that Swakya Ras is higher, which is not from the spiritual point of view. And therefore, he's sometimes seen in that way. You'll see, and you have to know, make this in a notation if, for those of you who are preachers, that sometimes the great acharyas will speak something that is different than the absolute truth in order to get people away from acting in the wrong way. I'll give you an example. Um, there is, in our tradition, there is what is called Siddha Pranali initiation that at a certain level, when a person is advanced in Krishna consciousness, he go, his spiritual master recommends him to go to a Siddha Pranali guru and learn about his uh, eternal relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. That is called one is, uh, one's uh, uh, actual, identity who are you in the spiritual world what is your relationship with krishna what is your color what is your dress where do you live what is your name what is your age all of these are part of the sunni pranam so bhakti siddhanta saraswati and actually bhakti vinoda course started bhakti siddhanta saraswati removed that whole process from the Gopi of Vaishnav tradition and Srila Prabhupada followed in that because people were again taking advantage of that and using it in a pretentious way to say, well, I'm a Gopi and I'm a cowherd boy like this, when they were not even, you know, they couldn't even chant their rounds properly. <laughs> so it became a feature of the degradation and Prabhupada stopped it in 1970 it was actually developing in ISKCON too. Devotees were actually uh, surreptitiously adopting these different moods of the residents of Vrindavan and claiming to be of that particular uh, rasa and meeting and discussing these higher principles. When Prabhupada found out about it, he immediately stopped it. And that was called the Gopi, Gopi Baba Club. So Jiva Goswami, and others, sometimes they write against uh, something that is authorized because it is being misused and in the wrong way, just like you see in the, the life of Lord Buddha. Buddha, he, um, although animal sacrifice is part of the Vedic culture, 
it's done to give the old animal a new body and rejuvenate the animal, but it has to be done according to proper mantras with qualified Brahmins in a particular setting. So when Buddha came, he stopped all that. And he said, you know, just worship the Eightfold Process of Enlightenment. Uh, and uh, he, although he was God himself, he never presented himself as the Supreme Lord, but as a great soul, and so they worshiped him. So Buddha tricked the atheist non-devotees who are using the scriptures to kill animals surreptitiously and then enjoy eating, uh, you know, eating the meat when actually it, it is an authorized process, but it was being done in, uh, in an unauthorized way. So you'll find that happens also. Same with um, Sankaracharya. Sankaracharya is Lord Shiva. And he appeared as this great personality called Shankar. And what did he do? He taught monism. He taught that the absolute truth is one, not, not one and different simultaneously, as mentioned in the Vaishnav culture. The absolute truth is a chintya, beta, beta, tattva. The chintya means inconceivable, beta, beta means different and non different, beta, a beta. And tattva means the, the, the spiritual principle of truth. So the absolute truth is of that nature that everything is one with and different from the absolute truth. But Shankaracharya came right after the time of Lord Buddha. And Buddha had taken people off the Vedas, saying, forget your Vedas. Although he was Krishna himself, he saw people were misusing the Vedas for their own selfish interest. And therefore, he taught the Eightfold Process of Enlightenment away from the Vedic culture and basically he taught high principles of morality. So to get people back on the Vedas, uh, Shankaracharya followed in the footsteps. Now he's Lord Shiva. He's a Vaishnava, Vaishnava Yada Shambhu. He's the greatest of all Vaishnava. But he presented this impersonalist aspect of philosophical knowledge as being the topmost to get people back on the Vedas but in a monistic way, teaching that God is one and the absolute truth is one. The absolute truth is, has no form. He is the uh, unmanifested, undeveloped, or un, unvariegated Brahman effulgence. And then of course, right after Sankaracharya, we have Ramanujacharya who got people back on Vishishta Veda, describing the principle of the Jiva's relationship with the Supreme Lord as being the same and different. But it wasn't complete until Madhvacharya actually followed and came and completed that. And therefore, after Madhvacharya, then we had Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who taught the complete process again. So you see how gradually the absolute truth is being delivered in different stages according to the mentality of the people of the time to understand and accept. And so this is how we can understand the different teachers who come in the line of the Supreme Lord and teach according to time, place, and certain candidate. Candidate means what is the mentality of the people at the time. Buddha couldn't teach you know, from the Vedas, because people were using the Vedas and were very uh, selfish and very, you know, uh, wrong way. They were using it for their own selfish interests. And you'll find that even happens today, um, even in our Krishna consciousness movement. People study the philosophy and have their own insight on what is the understanding. Uh, sometimes they take Srila Prabhupada's statements out of context and twist it around to make it sound something different than what actually Prabhupada intended it to be. Now that is the history. Uh, therefore, you'll see as the uh, 
uh, the involvement of spiritual knowledge continues, there's always a need to represent the truth in a slightly different way without changing the essential principles that make up the truth. And Srila Prabhupada was so expert at doing that. Yeah. But he left it up for us to make sure we maintained it, to, to maintain it out and to explain it more and more in a personalized way. And so you'll find, because even if you, if you study Srimad Bhagavatam, in certain areas of the Bhagavatam, if you study it, you can understand that from the impersonal perspective, it appears to be the supreme perspective by taking certain verses and explaining it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Sankaracharya was a gentleman. He did that with Bhagavad Gita. He explained it in a different way, but he didn't touch Srimad Bhagavatam because he knew Bhagavatam was the best. Um, and he, therefore he gave his, what is called Sarira, Sariraka Basya, which was a commentary on Krishna's Bhagavad Gita and in somewhat of an impersonal way. And so Jiva Goswami is expert at explaining the knowledge of, of tattva or the highest truths from different angles of vision. Mahajano Yena Katasapanta. This is a very important line from one verse from the Mahabharat, which is mentioned in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that various types of philosophical teachings are presented accordingly, according to time, place, and circumstance. And therefore, people can get confused. When they study and read, they don't know what is the absolute truth. So how can they understand what is the actual principle of practice on the nature of the absolute truth? And what is the foundation of that philosophy that supports that? And the answer is the last line in that verse, Mahajano Yena Katasapanta. One has to follow in the footsteps of the great souls. In other words, one has to accept a spiritual master who comes in the line according to one of the four sampradayas. In our particular sampraday, we have Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya. Lord Brahma is our sampradaya Acharya. And uh, Madhvacharya is also there, and then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then you have Sri Sampradaya, you have Rudra Sampradaya, you have the Kumara Sampradaya, the four Sampradayas. Each of these Sampradayas have, uh, has established the principles of worship of the Supreme Lord, either as Krishna in Vrindavan as the highest, or, or the Supreme Lord Narayan, in Vaikuntha as the highest. Both are authorized, if but one is, one is a different level of understanding the nature of the absolute truth. Because we are followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we are, and he is Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna, Nohi Onya. He is Krishna who has appeared in the mood of Srimati Radharani to teach the mood of Sri Vrindavan Dham in a very direct way through the process of Nam Sankirtan. Goloka Prema Dan Hari Nam Sankirtan Ratin Jam Milo Kene Upai. That the process of pure devotional service uh, on, in, in focusing on Sri Vrindavan Dham is the most authorized. A form of knowledge coming from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't write hardly anything. He only, only wrote eight verses known as the Shikshastika. Srila Prabhupada says those eight verses of Shikshastika contain the entire process of pure devotional service. So Mahaprabhu only wrote those eight verses, but through the acharyas who study those eight verses break it down and explain the different meanings from different angles of vision have concluded that in those eight verses, the entire process of pure devotional service is being explained. And to, to, to expand that, the, the, uh, the six Goswamis of Vrindavan 
are the followers of, and most authorized followers of Lord Chaitanya to write books on pure devotional service about Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. And Jiva Goswami is the most profuse of all of the writers. He has written 400,000 verses on uh, science of pure devotional service. And he, his writing, uh, although he's explaining the scriptures, even in his explanations, you require explanations <laughs> because <laughs> you read the Sindharvas, you will have to read and reread until you can really clear, clarify what is actually being explained like that. So this is uh, Jiva Goswami. Uh, there are many wonderful stories about Jiva Goswami. How <clears throat> apparently he was chastised by Rupa Goswami because uh, one very proud scholar had come to Vrindavan and had challenged Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami in a debate. Uh, Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami didn't want to bother with this arrogant scholar. So they said, you know, uh, well, he said, if you don't want to debate me, then you have to sign my paper saying that I have defeated you. And they said, sure, where's the paper? And they signed it just to get rid of this person. But Jiva Goswami wasn't so happy that his uncles were had submitted to this person. And this person was proud that he somehow or other defeated, which he didn't. He just got their signature just to get rid of him. So he, he debated this person. And uh, he... he um, he destroyed him. He, he completely annihilated this person in the philosophical discussion. And this person came running back to Rupa Goswami and explained that, you know, how intelligent Jiva Goswami was. When Rupa Goswami found out, he somewhat became a little upset with Jiva Goswami. Why? He says, you're living in Vrindavan and you're becoming proud. It's not our business to debate these, these, these personalities. So he chastised Jiva Goswami for that. But Jiva Goswami was acting simply to protect the honor and prestige of Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, who were actually, uh, you know, very superior in knowledge to this person. But they didn't want to be bothered with you know, just defeating him. So they just said, all right, we're defeated. Just give us the paper, we'll sign it. But Jiva Goswami felt insulted by that and he defeated him. There are many wonderful stories like that on Jiva Goswami. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's criticized by Sahajas and people not in our Sampradaya were writing certain things that apparently were not true, but have been attributed to him as being <clears throat> his writings. Um, no one could defeat Jiva Goswami. Jiva Goswami is, his knowledge is so deep and so profuse and so, let me say, elevated in the Shastras that he, <clears throat> when, uh, Srila Prabhupada, uh, before he came to the West, uh, he was living at Radha Damodar Temple in Sri Vrindavan Dam, which is the temple established by Jiva Goswami. And so therefore it's explained that Srila Prabhupada was praying to both Rupa and Jiva Goswami to empower him to spread Krishna consciousness in the Western world. Both of them being profuse literary uh, writers on the deep science of Krishna consciousness, Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, uh, uh, Upadesh Amrita, uh, our treatises that we have in our, in our uh, 
library that are, are meant to be studied and practiced by the devotees in the ISKCON movement. And so we are followers of Rupa Goswami, supported by all of the knowledge by Jiva Goswami, especially the Sandarbhas. The Sandarbhas are worth reading and studying like that. Yeah. Okay, so this is a little bit about Jiva Goswami, like that. Um, we also have Jagadish Pandit. Um, I don't have too much knowledge on Jagadish Pandit. I didn't take any time for um, trying to uh, uh, read about him, but I can uh, I can I can read something about Jiva uh, Jagadish Pandit, which might be helpful in understanding a little bit about his life. Um, this is Jagadish Pandit. His, his father's name was Kamalakshan. His grandfather was Bhatta Narayan. In his previous life, he was Chandra Hassan. And then um, it says that let's see, let me see. Describes a little bit here. Lord Chaitanya performed a Sankirtan festival at the house of Jagadish Pandit. Lord Chaitanya was so pleased by Jagadish Pandit, he gave, he came and said, I will eternally remain in your house in the form of this deity. He had received a deity from Lord Chaitanya and he worshiped that deity as being non different to him. Deity is Gaur Gopal, and is still being worshiped there. Jagadish was the brother of Haranya Garba, Haranya, who were both, um, they were the father of Radhana Das Goswami, Jagadish and Haranya. Okay. And today is his, uh, well, it's his appearance day. Um, this gives you some details of his devotion to his deity and to Lord Chaitanya. And Jagadish Pandit supported Lord Chaitanya's Kirtan movement in a very direct way. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll, since it's almost one hour later, we'll stop here and see if there's any comments or questions. <laughs> we can go to. We can go to the gallery and have all the devotees appear on in their manifested form. <laughs> Wonderful. Very nice stories, Maharaj. Thank you so much for enlightening us. Those small stories, they touch our heart. Maharaj, I um, could not catch the term that you were mentioning that um, when the spiritual must, no, the, when the guru would send the very sincere devotee to the spiritual master to know what his or hers internal relationship with Krishna is. What was that term called, Maharaj? It's called Siddha Pranali. How do you spell that, Maharaj? S-I-D-D-H-A P-R-A-N-A-L-I Siddha Pranali. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, the Siddhapradali initiation, but don't try it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
We asked the devotees to turn on your cameras so you can all appear in your manifested forms. Okay, there you go. It's getting closer. Any questions, devotees? Please unmute yourself or raise your hand. Oh, we have to. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Krishna. Let me see. I don't have, yeah. Um, <clears throat> can you please um, explain again the difference between what Ramanuja Prabhu contributed, contributed and what Madhvacharya contributed? Well, one is called Vishishta uh, Dvaita, that's Ramanuja Charya. There, you have to really see there is a there is a difference of philosophical explanation of the relationship between the jiva and the supreme lord between these two personalities. So practically, it's the same, but there's the it was called Vishishta Dvaita, where uh, um, Madhvacharya did um, Dvaita Advaita. Um, I would have to really go into the teachings of, uh, of um, Ramanujacharya to get that particular explanation of the jiva's relationship with this Lord that is slightly different than mentioned by the other acharyas. There's a certain feature of that relationship. Uh, I don't have my full library with me. And so that particular text that has that in it, I'm, I don't have handy, but you have to, it requires some study it's not just a, a uh, principle to be mentioned. It requires some study. It's based on the jiva, us, the living entities, the relationship with the absolute truth is a slightly different explanation of the tattva of that relationship was between Madhvachari and uh, Ramanujachari. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't but have that yeah. But at least the similarity between the two is that they they both basically for the first time um, introduced the fact that the Jiva and the Supreme Lord are two distinct entities, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the point. <laughs> That's the main point. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or you don't find that in Sankara Acharya. Oh, no. No. Okay. Yeah. Raman, Ramanuja Acharya was fighting the was fighting the impersonalists directly, constantly. Same with Madhvacharya. Both of them were stalwart preachers that were facing constantly uh, organized debates between themselves and the Mayavadis and the impersonalists. And that was their main preaching. And Madhvacharya, he established that as one of the, his principles to defeat Mayavadi philosophy. Uh, so the Madhvas are really, really enthusiastic to defeat the Mayavadis. They are not only enthusiastic, are they are heavy when it comes to fighting with the Mayavadis. Mayavadis are afraid of the Madhvas. If you study the life of Ramanujacharya, you'll see how he was persecuted for his preaching also. Because he was preaching against the times. Who was persecuted? Madhvacharya or Ramanujacharya? Ramanujacharya was persecuted a lot. Hmm. He was saved by his disciples, but they tried to, Ramanujacharya, they tried to kill Ramanujacharya. 
but that was unsuccessful. Was um, Madhavendra Puri a direct disciple of Madhvacharya, or there was some in between? Mm, that's a good question. I believe he is, yeah, he's a direct. It was Madhavendra Puri that brought uh, Radharani's worship into the Sampradaya. Uh -huh. it, was just, it was just Krishna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's mentioned that he is, he is, he was a direct, I believe a direct disciple of Madhav, Madhvacharya. But I'd have to, I'd have to really clarify to see, we'd have to see the time periods when both of them were appearing to really understand that. Um, you, you said that that Madhavendra Puri, he brought, he introduced Radharani. So before that, you said it was just Krishna, but would it not have been, let's say, um, I don't know, Narayan, Lakshmi Narayan, before, yeah. before Madhavendra Puri? Yeah, um, Madhavendra Puri was the one that brought in the mood of Radha Krishna worship before mm -hmm. it was Lakshmi Narayan, and still mm -hmm. is within the Madhva Sampradaya, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Madhavendra Puri was the, the grand the param guru of Lord Chaitanya. Yes, yes, yes. So he was placed in that sampradaya to, because uh, uh, Lord Chaitanya actually met Madhvacharya, when Madhvacharya was on the planet, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm going to appear in your sampradaya. But the Lord wasn't even on the planet at the time. He just appeared to him and saying that, you know, soon I will appear in your Sampradaya. He said that to Madhavendra Puri? No, Madhvacharya. Oh, Madhvacharya. Okay, okay. Yeah. But Madhvacharya, they worship Lakshmi Narayan. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But they also accept Radha Krishna worship. Mm. So that that's really you'll see that in their their uh, their preachers and their disciples, they kind of go between both of the different aspects of both of Vrindavan and one of the Madhvas left India many years ago, and he came to the West and he came to New Vrindavan. And he started preaching Radha, uh, Radha Krishna, Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan when he was in New Vrindavan. I was there. I actually was, was there to, to meet him and listen to him. But later he was highly criticized when he returned for, for traveling outside of India because it says if you, if you leave the, the land of India, you become fallen. But he did that to preach. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. But he was preaching Krishna's pastimes. <laughs> Some of the chief mudbites also glorified in Srila Prabhupada's work in spreading Krishna consciousness all the world around the world. There was two um, two great personalities. Can you say that last line again? Hmm? You said, what did you say about the mud bites just now? Yeah, the uh, two of the chief mud bites was, what was his name? Tejo something, <laughs> can't remember his name. But he, he, I met him, he came to our Sangha in, in, in uh, Udupi when we did a Sangha there, the devotees, in Chalpati under the guidance of Radhana Swami. Tejo are, are Pejo Armat Swami and Tejo Armat Swami. Yeah. So, Tejo Armat Swami actually glorified Lord uh, Srila Prabhupada for spreading God consciousness all around the world. They were, they were never 
uh, envious of Srila Prabhupada, nor did they take issue. But they still followed their tradition. You know. They saw, they appreciated the work that ISKCON had done to, to, to preach Krishna consciousness around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. One philosophical difference with them, which is quite distinct. Um, and that remains to this day. Mm -hmm. What what is that? Uh, Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma. The pastime of Brahma Mohan Leela. Yeah. They don't accept it. Why? Because they say Brahma is the head of the sampradaya, and oh. they say they say Brahma cannot be become bewildered. Uh huh. Yeah. He was by Krishna. Mm -hmm, right. But they only accept that Leela. Mm -hmm. They're called the Tattva Vladis. Uh, the, the followers of Madhavacharya are called the Tattva Vladis. The Tattva Vladis sounds like very generic. I mean, it is a generic statement, but that specifically relates to the followers of. When you say Tattva Vadis, you think of you know, the followers of Madhvacharya. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's true also, because it is a generic term, Tattva Vadi. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your interesting questions. <laughs> I wish I could answer them all. No, no, that's that was fine for me. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji, for your very interesting questions. Do we have any last minute questions for Maharaj from anybody? Hi, Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. I'll just to share for that. Um, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful class and very inspiring pastimes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. I really like uh, about uh, Jiva Goswami, Srila Jiva Goswami. Uh, uh, so, Guru Maharaj, so can we um, have access uh, to those Sandarbhas uh, which he has written, Guru Maharaj? The Sandarbhas? By yeah. Jiva Goswami. Yeah. yeah, they're they're available. There's two versions that are being that are circulating in ISKCON. One is by Kushikrata, and the other one is by Banu Swami. Uh, I have I have a set of the Sandarbhas and by Banu Swami. So Banu Swami has taken the Sandarbhas and presented it. So he's a scholar in our movement, Banu Swami. Um, Banu Swami, and then also, I think one other devotee who was in the Gaudiya Math also did uh, the Sundarvas. But you'll find it's a slightly different presentation, but the essence is still there. Some people like Kushakrata's presentation, and others like Banu Swami's presentation. But is there, each of the Sundarvas are one book. First you take, uh, you read the Tattva Sundarva first, and then you go to um, Bhagavad Sundarva. From Bhagavad Sundarva, you go to Paramatma Sundarva. Paramatma Sundarva, you go to, I believe, 
Bhakti Sandarva, and then you go to Krishna Sandarva, and then Priti Sandarva. And Kramya Sandarva is more like a summary of all of the Sandarvas. It's, it's really good to study these, this literature and to see the depth of our, our tradition in transcendental and philosophical knowledge. You won't find this anywhere, anywhere in the three worlds, it's such depth of knowledge on the nature of the absolute truth. The absolute truth is, cannot be fully studied. It's just too, too complex. Even the Vedas, although the Vedas are as complete as possible still, there is still more that could be included. <laughs> But if you study from three angles of vision, one is called uh, one is called um, Sandini, Sambit, and Ladini, or the three aspects of Krishna. Krishna is existence, potency. Krishna is knowledge potency in Krishna's pleasure potency. And then the Vedas are described into three categories. There's Sambandha. If you read Bhakti Vinoda Kaur's book on Sambandha, he breaks down all of the categories in the Sambandha category and explains them to a question and answer uh, presentation. And then you have Abhideya, and you have Pryogena. So these are, the Vedas com, are, consist of these three categories. Sambandha means relationship. What is my relationship with Krishna? What is my relationship with the spiritual master? What is the nature of my relationship with different living entities in different categories? What is my relationship with the material energy? And so Sambandha is the largest of all the categories within the Vedas. And uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, there's two books. It's called Bhakti, let me see, Vinod Bhava. It's called Vinod Bhava. And he covers those three categories in a question and answer session on each of the three sections. So the Vedas fit into all of those three categories. Because unless you have a, a working knowledge of Sambandha, you can't really execute the process of bhakti properly. <clears throat> Not a complete knowledge, but a working knowledge of Sambandha. What is my relationship with other living entities? That's the most important part as the foundation for the execution of devotional service. It's all about relationship. And Abhideya is the process, the activities of devotional service. And the smallest and most, most the highest of all categories of Vedic knowledge is called Prayojana. Prayojana means the goal. And that is Prema Pumartha Mohan, the categories of loving Krishna. In Sri Vrindavan Dav, loving, loving the Lord also in the Vaikuntha realm. So those are included in the Prayojana section of the Vedas. You get these two volumes by Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, where he discuss, discusses in a question and answer form these three categories. You can get a real clear understanding of what the process is and how to, you know execute it in a proper way. Everything is based on spiritual sentiment, but it's all guided by philosophical knowledge. As Prabhupada said, um, philosophy without, uh, what is that, philosophy without, uh, Without devotion, 
is mental speculation and devotion without philosophy is sentiment or fanaticism. You have to combine these two principles in everything that we understand. What is the emotional expression guided by the philosophical knowledge? That's why we hear regularly from the spiritual master on both of these principles. It's like when you hear Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, and they sound just like ordinary boy and girl pastimes. So people get sentimental about these things, but they don't understand the basis of it. And that basis has to be understood in relationship. What is the nature of Krishna? And what is the nature of the Vrindavan atmosphere? And how this exchange is actually the highest form of transcendental knowledge and spiritual love and not something that you can compare to in, the, in this material world. So unless you have that understanding, you know, you'll, uh, you'll become what they call sahajya, taking things cheaply. And then you don't make any advancement, you simply go the other way. So it's a great science. <laughs> we have many books. So Prabhupada said you have enough to read. But if you can read and study Bhagavatam your whole life, then you'll know everything. Because Prabhupada put everything in the Bhagavatam. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Now, there's where you want to put your focus on Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. These are the two main scriptures. Sure, God, Maharaj. Definitely. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. And hearing regularly, Srinvata Swakata Krishna Purnya Shravana Kirtanaha Vridanta Stoa Badani Vidhunoti Hasid Viritsatam. This verse is spoken by Sutta Goswami in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first. Canto second chapter, that uh, one who develops an urge to hear about Krishna, then Krishna, within the heart of that devotee, purifies that devotee by cleansing their heart and directing them to this, to on the path of pure devotional service. Krishna does the cleansing when you're eager to hear. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Any last minute questions, comments from devotees? Yeah, hi Krishna. Maharaj, can I just follow up on um, what you just said about the books to, to focus on? So I think I might have heard that the one book that, um, I think he, it was two, but one book that, that Srila Prabhupada took with him on the Jaladuta was the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Was that correct? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And um, he presented Chaitanya Charitamrita in a summarized version when he first came called Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. Mm -hmm. That was so the first, the yeah, that was the. So, mm. so the reason why I'm asking is, you know, Let's say we have, but if we if we could only focus on one book, why would you not choose the CC? Well, because, over, yeah. over the other two. Well, Prabhupada writes about that. He says that Bhagavad Gita is preliminary in Bhagavatam. He says Bhagavad Gita is preliminary. Bhagavatam is actually college, and Chaitanya Charitamrita is actually postgraduate study. And so uh, the main two scriptures of the, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, not just Vaishnavas, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas are Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. 
Please let me too. Because the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is living Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's especially why I was thinking that, you know, since CC kind of like includes Bhagavatam, right, then I would think that um, if I had to, you know, rely on one, then I would pick the CC. No, I, think, I think CC is more exclusive in, uh, in uh, talking about the, the activities and pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But in Bhagavatam, you have 10 subject matters. You have Sarga Visarga, which is creation and sub-creation. And Prabhupada says that you cannot understand Krishna and Vrindavan until, um, unless you have a working knowledge of Krishna being the supreme power in existence as the force that has created everything. Otherwise, we misunderstand Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. We can't enter into that. That's why first canto and second canto are sarga and visarga mostly as a foundation for understanding higher knowledge. Mm -hmm. And this, the, the historical setting by which the Bhagavatam is unfolding also. You know, the Pandavas and the Battle of Kurukshetra, which is, of course, the foundation for the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. So they're all interrelated. <laughs> but I mean, when Prabhupada has said different things at different times and with different emphasis, but when you see where he's emphasized, he does definitely says Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, these are the two main scriptures. <laughs> yeah, I'm also thinking. Uh. And he also, then Chaitanya Charitamrita is postgraduate knowledge like that. But then Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati will give you another angle of vision. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, those who read Chaitanya Charitamrita first, can they can understand Srinathana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed I've heard that um, argument also because, because Lord Chaitanya, he shows us what devotion and action looks like. Right, exactly. And that's what Bhagavatam is about, right? But that Bhagavatam deals with also the other incarnations of the Lord, such as, you know, the Matsya, Korma, not, not Korma, but Matsya, Varaha, the Shringa, all of the Vaikuntha realms. Because not each and every devotee has their, what we call, Siddha Deha, or their internal relationship with Krishna in the spirit in Vrindavan. Some are Vaikuta Basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, just for example, when Lord Chaitanya was here, Murari Gupta was one of his associates, but Murari Guptaism was an incarnation of Panama. Yeah, so are you saying, therefore, that if a person were to only focus on the CC, and if they, if their bhav, their natural, you know, bhav is not is not um, Madhurya or you know Vrindavan, you know Vrindavan bhav, then they wouldn't be able to relate so much, right? Because at least if they read the Bhagavatam they could relate to? Well, it depends on the, on the adhikari of the individual. That's why we, in order to preach, we take it from the basic adhikari and not from the highest adhikari. For instance, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, you know, he was a shakta before he actually became a Vaishnava. But how did he become a Vaishnava? He came across a, a, the, the writings of Chaitanya Charitamrita. And he studied that. And then from there, he actually became a Vaishnava. Then he started to expand and his preaching into other areas of Vaishnavism also. Shabda but that was Bhagavad Gita. I mean, 
you want to start off with CC, that's nice, but <laughs> I hope you understand that uh, that the uh, that the the principles of CC are foundationally explained in uh, Bhagavad Gita. Shakta means Lord Shiva. No, no, that's the that's the energy of the Lord. You said that Bhaktivinoda was originally Shakta? A, shak a Shakta worship, yeah, Shakta worship. That's in his life. That's the, he, he even writes about it in his own biography. But so Shakta means he worshipped what? You know, the, the, the energy of the Lord, not the Lord directly. Durga, like his, his, Durga oh, Devi. Yeah. The female aspect of the energy you know, Shakti, they call it Shakti, Shakti worship. That's that's big in Bengal. Most most Bengalis are followers of Durga, like that, or Lakshmi. Because Lakshmi has her own sampradaya, that's the Sri Sampradaya also. <laughs> You're trying to figure it out. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to understand what worship of Shakta means. Shakta, Shakta I'm like just, that. I'm just mentioning Bhakti Vinoda Kaur's previous connection with spirituality and how, you know, he, he went from the Shakta level to the Vaishnav level simply by coming in contact with Chaitanya Charitamrita. Mm -hmm. And then he did a great study on CC. Then he understood. And that was around the 1850s. And then, of course, in 1870, Bhakti Siddhanta was born. 1874. So that was in his early life. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah, I never knew that he was <laughs> anything but Vaishnav before. You see, in our temples, we have Bhagavad Gita classes. Prabhupada studied, started in the evening, Srimad Bhagavatam classes in the morning. But he also gave classes in Chaitanya Charitamrita. He also gave classes in Nectar Devotion. And he also gave some classes in Sri Upanishads also. Prabhupada covered that that range for preaching. And so if you want to go to higher knowledge, you, you have to just like if you want to go to higher yeah, and, you know mathematics, you better have basic understanding of one plus one is two and two plus two is four. Because if you get those wrong, you know Yeah, everything else is wrong. Yeah. That's why Krishna and Bhagavad Gita, what does he start off with when he's teaching? What's his first teaching? You're not the body. <laughs> no, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Until you uh, at least have a working knowledge of that. You may not realize it, but you have a working knowledge of that. Then you can't go on to understand higher principles. It's just not possible. You have to understand that you're something different than this body that you inhabit. Mm -hmm. And Bhagavatam is also systematically uh, given step by step coming up to the 10th canto. That's why the 10th canto is not the first canto, it's the, <laughs> it's the yeah. later canto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is what in Chaitanya Charitamrita? What's the first chapter? What's the subject matter of the first chapter? Isn't it the Panchatattva? That's the seventh chapter. Seventh chapter. The first, the ch first chapter is Guru Tattva. <laughs> mm. It's all about what is a guru and what is the. Uh, Position of a guru, the importance of accepting guru. It's all about guru tattva. 
back to the first chapter, I think even the second chapter too. Yeah, chapter one, the spiritual masters. <laughs> Two kinds of spiritual masters, Shiksha Guru and Diksha Guru. Both are equal aspects of the Supreme Lord. Both have, uh, both are qualified, but have different functions in relationship to the, to the disciple. You see, yes. So everything is systematically given in the scriptures to take us from one, one spiritual principle to another. And when it's not there, sometimes it's not there, then the purports given by the acharyas help to clarify each of the different stages. That's why just to read the shastras without the purports is it's not it's practically impossible to understand. Where does Brahma Samhita fit in? That's the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> And that's given in a very direct way. And these, I think, 64 verses are mentioned. Like that. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he's the only one that I know. Well, no, actually, Bhakti Vano, Bhakti Siddhanta, Jiva Goswami are the three commentators on Brahma Samhita. First Jiva Goswami did one, then Bhakti Vinod, and then Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati also. You said Bhakti Vinod, Dr. he also the commentary, those? Yeah, yeah, that's mentioned. He did a commentary on Jiva Goswami's work, or he did a, what we call a Atika. Atika is more like a critical and critical presentation of the principles. But I mean, I, I, there's only one person in our whole society who ha, has ever done a systematic presentation that I know of, of uh, Brahma Samhita, and that was Tamar Krishna Goswami. And it's brilliant. It was really brilliant what he did. But he took he took all of those 64 verses and I think he did it in, he did it twice in two different places, once in Mayapur and then in Vrindavan in 1990 and 1991. And he systematically went through Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's commentaries, but he referenced everything uh, on his own study from Srimad Bhagavatam and from other works of the Goswamis to support the texts that are being mentioned. It's really an amazing presentation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and then you have Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, which is also, that's, the, that's also a condensed version of the Srimad Bhagavatam by Sanatana Goswami. Mm -hmm. and then that was presented by Gopi Pranada. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you can go into all of these, but unless we have a working knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, we might get confused with this higher knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Mataji, for your questions. I see that somebody has raised their hand. You may go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Hare Krishna and Chandra Mali Swami Prabhupada. 
Mr. And Mrs. N there, can you appear in person? <laughs> My name is Neha. Okay, can you turn on your video? I'm not able to turn it on, Prabhuji. Okay. I have a question, Prabhuji. This lecture that you did today, I didn't understand anything. So if that lady was asking, I am asking that I did not understand anything what you said or what you preach. So in order to understand, like I read only Gita. When I read Bhagavatam, I don't understand. When I read Charita, Chaitanya Charita Amrit, I don't understand. So what does a person like me, where should I start? I'm really confused. I ask so many people, they don't know. So I'm asking you. I, I think uh, in order for, for you to understand better, your individual reading will need to be supported by hearing lectures from the pure devotees. So Srila Prabhupada has systematically gone through the first, second, third, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam giving classes. So I would say you listen to Srila Prabhupada's lectures on Srimad Bhagavatam, starting with the first canto. And then as you hear his explanations, because you're reading, but you don't understand because it requires explanations, but Prabhupada not only speaks, he explains. So I think if you did a systematic program of hearing from Srila Prabhupada every day, on Bhagavatam, starting from the beginning, everything will become clear. Thank you, Hare Krishna. For instance, I'll give you an example. When you read something you don't understand, what do you do? You read it again. And if you still don't understand it, you read it again. As you continue to reread it, you get a little bit more each time. That's one way. Just read, read, reread, reread, reread. And that's Prabhupada's program for, for, for understanding things that are difficult to understand is the process of rereading. But even more direct is to hear from the pure devotees as they give their explanations on the text that you're trying to understand. Is that okay, Neha? Yes, Prabhupada. Do you have Srila Prabhupada's lectures? No. We can download them from the internet. Um, I think there is a Prabhupada.com is one of the sites where they include Srila Prabhupada's lectures. Um, there's other, there's at least three or four different sites where you can find Prabhupada's lectures. Oh yeah, you can go on, uh, what is that called? Um, that great website, it's the best in ISKCON. What is it called? Prabhupadwani. Say again. Prabhupadwani. That's one, but there's another one. ISKCON is Desire Tree. That's it. Go to ISKCON Desire Tree. Like everything you there, everything is there. That's why it's called ISKCON Desire Tree. ISKCON Desire Tree. That is com. you'll get everything. Not only Prabhupada's lectures, but lectures from all, all of the uh, disciples of Prabhupada also. Mm -hmm. Here, if you want to learn, you got to develop this uh, program for regular hearing. If you don't hear regularly, you won't learn. Yeah, SoundCloud also. There are many places you can find lectures. Yeah.
Okay, anything else? <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my obeisances. All glories to Shri Guru. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. Mm. Maharaj, we are also Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Sampradaya, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, why do, do they don't believe in uh, Brahma's uh, stealing the cows and uh, no, I mean, just the Madhvacharyas don't. The Madhvites don't. We do. It's in the Bhagavatam. It's the uh, 13th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto. And it's most, it's interesting because Srila Prabhupada began the 10th canto when he was towards the very end of his stay with us. And he finished 13 chapters. So the last chapter Prabhupada did was Brahma Mohan Lila, <laughs> which is really, really sweet. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, but. As you said, Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Sampradaya. So Lord Chaitanya connected himself with the Madhva Sampradaya, which is connected with Lord Brahma. So that's why we're, we are followers in that way. But the Madhvas, you know, they, they have established their Sampradaya before, that, before Lord Chaitanya. And they also have a little difference of the philosophy in some parts. Particularly on this one wheel, that's it. Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful, wonderful class today. Thank you. So Thank you for having these wonderful classes. <laughs> This has been going on how many years now? <laughs> Maybe 12 years. 20 years? No, 12 years. Wonderful. That's, that's, that's glorious. Every day, Srimad Bhagavatam class for the last 12 years. Yeah, it was like um, uh, started in 2009. Nice. Thank you, much. Thank you for keeping it going. <laughs> Great service to the devotees. It's a wonderful service. We are very grateful to you for your association, Maharaj. This a little tiny insect in the in the bigger picture. The bigger picture is the real picture. I I I appear once in every two weeks and disappear after that. <laughs> you have you know every day there's wonderful devotees giving classes. Thank you, Mataji. Saying because of your blessings, the classes are running every day. That's what you know. True. I think it. I think it's because of your blessings. No. <laughs> and there's somebody. There's somebody standing right behind you, that I think is giving all the blessings. Yeah, their blessings.
Shri Sri Guru Sri Sri Radha Vrindavan, Sri Sri Radha Shamsunar in Vrindavan. Yes, Maharaj, their blessings. <laughs> Radha Shamsunar. And Jagannath Baldev Subhadra too. Mm. Maharaj, imperfect, uh, you know, beings like us, like if something should go without um, blockage, it's only the blessings of uh, great souls, Maharaj. So we're very grateful to you. You may come once in two weeks. That is a great blessing for us. But that really uh, uh, gives us uh, whatever we need to get the other speakers and keep it going. So it's only the blessings of uh, great souls, Maharaj, like you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm happy to do something, but everything you say is not correct. <laughs> okay, we got the uh, Abhiram, Abhiram Shaka there is going to defeat the lead to Tungi, and he will tell you how difficult it was when I was staying at his house. <laughs> It was a blissful experience, Maharaj. It was not difficult anyway. <laughs> I, I gave him... So mercy when you visit us. I gave so much trouble to the family. <laughs> they had no peace. <laughs> we have no words, Maharaj. We can only say that, uh, you know, whenever we visit his home, we remember, uh, you know, how... You used to be there, talk to us, take lunch and give us so many instructions, even play with us. We have a video of, uh, you know, you and all the kids and all of us playing ball. So. <laughs> Don't show that one. <laughs> <laughs> Cowherd boys in Vrindavan like to play ball. <laughs> Yes. It's your mercy, Maharaj, when you visit us and give us the guidance, instructions, so that we can continue a little bit of sadhana, what we do. Yeah, it's, uh, when I came to your house, I was thought I was in the wrong house. <laughs> I saw this palace. <laughs> it's Jagannath House, Maharaj. Jagannath Nivasa. It was actually... A, None different than Jagannath Puri. <laughs> Jagannath's not only there once, he's there twice, just to just to, to let everyone know that this is where he wants to be. <laughs> and the family is doing some really nice uh, outreach, pulling in more and more people. And uh, more people are getting connected with Krishna consciousness. Nice, wonderful team between Abhiram Saka and Shamagori. And they have weathered some storms too over the years and they still remain fixed in their preaching and in their practice of Krishna consciousness. Yes, Maharaj. Every Sunday they're hosting the Sunday program, practically all programs are hosted there. All Maharajs come there. So. And Abhi Ram has been sending me pictures of new people that are coming into the, into the fold. Something and something for the holidays. Just, just yesterday, the day before, he sent me some more pictures of another program with some more new people. Yeah, that was 31st night, Maharaj. Our way of attracting devotees instead of letting them go to some party somewhere. <laughs> yeah, this is the real party. <laughs> the party that never ends. <laughs> yep. We need a reason to keep celebrating, right? <laughs> Papa said. We could have a festival every day, he said. That is our tradition. <laughs> he didn't say just a gathering, he said a festival. Yes. Well, 
But Lalita Tangi, I don't know how to catch up to you. You, you escaped. Now you are, you're, in, you're in winter wonderland up there. Yeah, I terribly miss Maharaj. I'm going to have to come to Toronto and uh, take you back to Charlotte. <laughs> Please, Maharaj, or not, take me back to Godhead, Maharaj, with you, or wherever you go to assist you in Srila Prabhupada's service. <laughs> but I, I can see you left Charlotte in order to preach to the Torontoites. No, they really, Maharaj. They really, they really need it up there. It's, uh, it's oh, I more... needed some. I needed some. Uh, maintenance work because I was getting proud and very offensive. So, yeah. You were proud because you knew so much and you couldn't you couldn't use it. No. So you went someplace to use it. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, you and you know when I used to give class and I used to get stuck on something and I would say, Lalita, what is that verse or what is that? And you would give it to me immediately. Maharaj, you had already spoken, you would have already started the verse and, you know, giving us a chance to remember that. So, it's your mercy. Okay. Well, I don't know when I'll get to Toronto, but if I do, I'll knock on your door. Please, Maharaj, please, very, <laughs> we are very much waiting for you, Maharaj. Very, very yeah. nice devotees here. They have a very nice team for book distribution uh, under Vaishishika Prabhu's uh, guidance. Uh, they did very well in this uh, December marathon. Yeah, he focuses on Toronto. because Toronto is a great, great, great place for preaching. Really great place for preaching. Okay, so uh, it's a little past my lunchtime. Yeah. Like about, about an hour and a half past, but that's okay. Oh my God. <laughs> this is the real Prashad. Oh, Prashad. <laughs> yeah, we can maybe end the call, Mataji. Yes, let's go ahead and... And no last minute questions, I hope. So, one chakal patari pesha, the past. Thank you so much, Maharaj.